So check this out. Look at the craftiness of most of those who translated the Bible. I'm going to say a couple things to you that's going to help you realize. Now, I'm going to post a link below this video of um, the video that I did explaining Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, and how the, the proper translation is the sons of God, not the sons of Israel. And when you read the context, you see that it, it doesn't even make sense to read it as the sons of Israel. The proper translation is the sons of God. Why would they change it to the sons of Israel? Even though the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are older than the um, Hebraic artifact that they found, translates it as, I mean, reads as the sons of God. Why would they change it to the sons of Israel? Also, I'm going to save two links below this video to sources that prove to you why it should be the sons of Israel, the sons of God and not the sons of Israel. So let me paraphrase what I um what I'm talking about. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8 is a is a passage in the Bible that is different from the other chapters of Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy. It was written by Moses, right? In that passage, that verse specifically is explaining how in the beginning, before the nations were created as nations, God divided the nations of the earth according to the sons according to his sons, his angelic sons. Okay, the translation is according to his heavenly court or according to his um, heavenly sons or according to the sons of God, right? When you read chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, and you read that, you say, hmm, according to the sons of God, so did God give each district of the, of the earth to one of, to some of his sons to govern? Well, when you go to Psalms chapter 82, right? Yehovah, Elohim, Almighty God says, he's speaking about the judges of the districts of the earth, right? And he says, I myself have said, you are gods. All of you are sons of the Most High. Now, Bible translators, because they translate Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, as sons of Israel, they translate Psalms, they, they interpret Psalms 82 as the judges of Israel, the literal judges, right? Human judges. But in Psalms chapter 82, Yehovah says, I myself have said, you are gods, right? So you are all sons of the Most High. But you will die as men do. But you will die as men do. So that means these judges are not men. They are gods. They are sons of Elohim. They are the sons of God. Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. He says, he divided the nations according to the sons of God. And then in Psalms 80, 82, he says, I myself say you are gods. Yes, you are gods because I have made you gods. You are my sons. You are all Elohims. You are, you are all of you are gods. You are all my sons. But even though you are gods and not men, not human judges, even though you are gods, you will die as men do. Doesn't this sound familiar? Let's go to Ezekiel concerning the devil, who is also the God of this wicked system of things. The Bible, Paul called him the God of this wicked system of things. So did Peter, I believe. Or was it Peter or Paul? One of them called him the God of this wicked system of things. He is a God, lowercase g, but he's a false God because he does the opposite of what a true God is supposed to do. He's not, gov he's not doing his job correctly because remember, they, they, the devil is trying to prove a point against God. And God being as perfect as he is, he's allowing the devil to prove his case. Right, as in the case with Job. Also, in the book of Job, when the true sons of God gathered before him, and Satan also came in amongst them, and God asked them, Where are you coming from? He says, and he said, Have you set your eyes upon my servant Job? Okay, so God has a, a he is the God of the judges. He is, and these judges are also gods. And the devil came up in that meeting to, to, to present a case before God. Right? So let me back up. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. God divided the nations according to, the, to his sons, according to his angelic realm, heavenly, heavenly court, right? That's the same court that he held at the time of Job. And the devil came in because the devil is also a God. And God has given him the kingdoms of the world, which is why the devil was able to offer the kingdoms of the world to Christ when he came down. Okay? That tells you something about who Christ really is in, in application to, who, to, to God. But... Also, if you will remember, 
during the time of the, the King Ahab. King Ahab, God called a meeting where his sons came, angelic sons, not human sons, obviously, his angelic sons, and God said, who will fool Ahab? One spirit came to him, mentioned one. Another spirit came to him and says, this is what I'll do. And then God said, go ahead and do it and you'll be successful. God holds meetings with his angelic court, with his heavenly court, with his sons. They are sons of God in the sense of the word that they are actually literal sons of God. But I'm going to tell you something extra though. So Psalms 8, so Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8. I'm going off at the top of my head. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8. God divides the nations of the world according to his angelic heavenly court. Psalms 82, God says, you are all sons of the Most High. They are judges, right? They judge the earth. You are all sons of the Most High. Christ says, we will, some of us will come and rule with him as kings, priests, and judges over the earth. But they, are, they will judge even angels. So, they are, so these 144,000 will be in a position higher than the angels, right? So, so the judges are actually angelic beings, okay? So Psalms 82, God says, you are all sons of the Most High. I myself say you are God's sons of the Most High, but you will die as men do. Okay, they are angelic beings, but they will die as men do. Okay, okay. Now, doesn't that remind you of the of Ezekiel, the devil? He said, God says, you said in your heart, speaking of the devil, you said in your heart that you will climb to, to the top of Mount Zaphon, right? To, to above the judges, above the other gods above the other angels and you will try to make yourself like god you will try to be god over the other angels but yet god will will send you down to the valley of death and you will die as men do that means the devil is not a man but he will die as men do obviously the devil is not a man so when god speaks of the judges in psalms 82 he's not speaking of human judges he's speaking of his angelic sons who betrayed him right I myself have said you are God, but you will die as men do. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8. He's not speaking about human sons. He's speaking about his, his heavenly court. Now, that's why Christ, when he was on the earth, referred to the book of Psalms chapter 82. And he said, I hope it's Psalms chapter 82. I keep saying 82. I'm pretty sure it's Psalms 82. Verse, yeah. And just read the chapter. It's like the first five verses or so, or six or seven. Christ referred to the, the psalmist and he said, Remember when he when he called himself a son of God? Remember, the devil is a son of God. Gabriel is a son of God. Now, the, okay, before I get to that, the reason why these Bible translator, translators remove the term sons of God and put sons of Israel is because they don't want to accept that God has sons in heaven who are also gods. They don't want to accept that the devil is a son of God. But of course he's a son of God because he came because God created him. Now, the devil is not an only begotten son of God because actually, let me not get into that because you're probably going to turn off the video if I keep going on, on that route. But Christ called himself a son of God, right? He didn't say he was God. He said he was a son of God and they wanted to stone him because by him claiming that he's a son of God, he's making himself like God, right? And so they wanted to stone him. And then Christ said, what, what, what sin have I, have I committed? And then the, the, the Pharisees said, you, although a mere human, claim to be a God. He didn't, they didn't say you claim to be God. They said you claim to be a God. And Christ said he is a God, right? He's, he said he's a son of God. So neither Christ nor the Pharisees thought of him as God, but they thought of him as a God. Christ said, I am a son of God. So they interpreted him to be like God. The Pharisees wanted to stone him because by him claiming that he's a son of God, he's making himself as what? God. So even the Pharisees and humans at that time did not consider themselves as children of God. Okay? So by him by Christ saying he's the son of God, in, in a sense he's saying he's equal to God in the sense even though Christ says he's not equal to the Father, but the Father is greater than him. And the one who is sent is not greater than the one who sends. So obviously Christ is saying my Father is greater than I am, which he said multiple times. That's not even debated. Right? You can't even debate that. Okay. Christ said, "Wait, hold up. Didn't the psalmist in Psalms 82 say didn't didn't the psalmist write that even God, Jehovah himself said, I myself say you are God's sons of the most high. So if God is calling his sons as God's and I, and I am a son of God, am I not also a God? So what sin are you trying to stone me for? If the devil was to call himself a God, you can't say he's lying. He is a God, <laughs> but he's a lowercase g God because even God himself says you are God's, but you will die as men do. You will die as men do. 
So by them removing, by them removing the term sons of God, it's because they don't want to accept. It's the same reason why they wanted to stone our master Christ. It's the same reason why they wanted to stone Yeshua. Because Yeshua is calling himself a son of God. And they don't like that term, son of God. So, but when God said that he, when Moses wrote that God organized the nations of the world according to his heavenly court and according to the sons of God, they didn't like that term for the same reason why they didn't like the term when Christ used it, because they don't like to hear that. Because they, in their minds, that's blasphemy, because in their mind, God does not have sons. Just like Muslims, they do not believe that God has sons, but God clearly has sons. Psalms 82. God says, he himself says, you are God, sons of the most high. Paul or Peter, one of them wrote that the devil is the God of this wicked system of things. Now, God, God gave the kingdoms of the world to his sons, right? Some, some have, some, one, one angel is the God of this realm or the prince of this realm, like Africa, maybe a portion of Africa. Another one will be like a portion of South Africa, perhaps. Another one will be like a portion of um, um, I don't know, Asia, India, whatever. Each nation has their gods. But Israel's God is God. Israel's God is Jehovah. And the one who stands in behalf of Israel is Mikael, the archangel. And there can only be one archangel. You can't have multiple archangels because that would defeat the purpose of the word arch. You can't have multiple the best angels. It's like saying the, there are multiple almighty gods. It defeats the purpose of the word almighty. You can't have multiple almighty gods. There's only one almighty. But there are other gods, and out of those other gods, Yehovah, Elohim, is the almighty over all those other gods. He is the god of gods. That is a title that he shares with no one. But king of kings, he shares with even a Babylonian pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. Lord of lords, he shares with a pagan king. But god of gods, he shares that title with no one else. Even Christ is called king of kings and lord of lords. And Prince of Peace. Now, you remember when Daniel, in the book of Daniel, he said a prayer. And an angel was coming to give him a message. Daniel was in the land of Persia. Okay, at, at this point in time, he was no longer in Babylon. He was now in the district of Persia under the king Cyrus. He said a prayer to God. And an angel, God sent an angel to come and deliver the, a message to Daniel. Right, but the, the, message, the angel took 21 days to get to Daniel. Because the prince of Persia resisted the angel that God sent. Now, this prince of er Persia obviously is an angel because he resisted another angel. So obviously he's not a man, right? So again, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, when God divided the districts of the land according to the sons of God. So this prince of Persia is a son of God. He's an angel. He's an angelic being. We don't. The devil doesn't have a district. He, the devil has the whole world at his district because the devil, God has given the devil the kingdoms of the world to prove a point. But within those kingdoms of the world, there are different angel, angelic beings who govern each district. For the prince, for Persia, there is a prince of Persia. And because the angel was coming into Persia, he had to go past the angel that was governing Persia. And that angel resisted him for 21 days until Mikael, the archangel, came and helped him, right? Basically sorted things out and the angel was able to deliver the message to Daniel. So that's part of the reason why sometimes you may have a prayer and it will take a long time for your prayer to be answered. Because even though God is God, he's like, he sits back. He's the OG. He sits back and he lets his sons take care of things. And Michael is the, is the arch, ultimate archangel, is the archangel that God sends to do everything. He is the archangel of God. He is the messenger of God. Archangel means messenger of God or word of God. Any person who speaks God's message is a word of God. The Bible is a word of God because it has God's words in it. All prophets are words of God because they have God's word in them. Okay, so angels are God's words. They so angel doesn't just mean mess um angel, like wings and seraphim and cherubim. No, no, angel is anyone who comes in the name of Elohim, Anglos, messenger, word of El Elohim, angel, Anglos Elohim, word of God. But the ark word of God is Mikael. That tells you who Christ really is. That tells you who Mike, Michael really is. Michael is Christ. And I will make a video proving that. But I've seen certain videos that over that already shows that Michael is the archangel. And they and they they definitely agree with that, right? For example, Christ says, The day is coming when all those in the memorial tombs will hear my voice and will be resurrected. Right? They will hear my voice. Christ says they will hear my voice 
and will be resurrected. But then in 1 Thessalonians, or, or 2 Thessalonians, it says, Christ will come down from heaven with the trumpet call of his Father, of God, and will raise the dead with the voice of, an arch, of the archangel. So Christ is saying they will hear my voice and will be resurrected. And then in 1 Thessalonians, his voice is that of the archangel and they'll be resurrected. So archangel, well, if Christ is the word of God, if out of all the words, out of all the angels, out of all the messengers of God, Christ was the one who became flesh from heaven, the son of God who became flesh and dwelt with man, then he is the arch word of God. He is the word of God. He is the archangel of God. So there can never be any archangel apart from Christ because Christ is a word of God, a messenger of God, a prophet of God who came in God's name. He says, I came in my name. I, he said, I came in my father's name. I didn't come in my own name. He said, I came to glorify my father's name, not my own name. He said, I came to do my father's will, not my own will. He said, the one who sends is not greater, is, is, not, is not less than the one who is sent. So the one who is sent is less than the one who sends him. So Christ is admitting that he is less than the father. He is the word of God. Moses is the word of God, but he is not the ark word of God because he was never an angelic being who became flesh. Christ lived with his father, but he emptied himself and became a man because he didn't consider himself to be equal with his father. Okay, so Michael, the archangel, Michael also means the one who is like God. Now, I'm going to explain something to you about that, but I know I'm throwing a lot at you guys right now, but um, I don't even know where, where, um, where, where I left off, but... I go off on a tangent. It's, it's, it's so many things that people just don't realize. But God has sons. Okay. God has sons. Gabriel is the son of God. The devil is the son of God. All the myriads upon myriads of angels are all sons of God. Okay. And some of them have been given certain districts of, of the earth. Okay. So. But out of all these angels, there is only one archangel. You can't have multiple archangels. In Daniel, it said one of the foremost princes. But again, mistranslation. One of the foremost princes, but Mikael is the archangel. There are there are not there are not multiple archangels. And one would say, well, if Christ is the archangel, why is it that he couldn't rebuke the devil at the time of Moses when he was murmuring over when they were murmuring when they were when he had a dispute with the devil and he said, "May Jehovah, may Jehovah rebuke you." In a sense, may his father, may God, may our father rebuke you, right? Why didn't Christ denounce him at that time if he is Michael the archangel? Because it was only when Christ came to the earth that all authority was given him. Before he came to the earth, all authority was not given him. So he did not have the right to rebuke the devil. But now that all authority has been given him, guess what? At the time of Moses, Michael couldn't rebuke the devil. But in Revelation, now that all authority has been given Michael, guess what? Michael is going to do way more than rebuke the devil. He's going to destroy the devil. <laughs> He's going to wage war with the devil. Mike... Michael is a commander of angels. Christ is a commander of angels. Christ is going to come with his angels. Michael is going to battle the devil with his angels. So what? Michael has his angels and Christ has his own angels. Michael is a regular angel who has his own angels. And, and if Christ is God, God has his own angels. So what? Why does God have his own angels and Michael has his own angels? Why, why would God be a commander of angels and, and Michael be a commander of angels? That makes no sense. God does, is not a commander of angels. God is God. All angels belong to him. He doesn't, he's not a commander of some angels and then Michael was a commander of some angels. No, Michael is the commander of all angels. There was an angel, there was an angel that was watching over the Israelites when they were in the wilderness, when they came out of the, the, the out of Egypt, the angel that was leading them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God said to Moses, watch yourself regarding this angel because he will not forgive your errors. Because my name is within him. What type of angel can forgive sins? Hmm. When Christ came down, he said, daughter, your sins have been forgiven you. And they said, what type of man can forgive sins? And people who like to argue that Christ, that Christ has to be God because he, he, he has the authority to forgive sins. Well, then that angel who is watching over the Israelites has to be God too. Because he has the authority to forgive sins. If that angel was to materialize himself and become a man... He can forgive sins. Excuse my, my girlfriend in the background. That angel could say, I have the authority to forgive sins. And he won't be lying. It won't be a blasphemy. Because God told Moses that this angel is a special angel. Because my name is within him. And he will not forgive your transgressions. This is the special angel. That's the same angel that was leading them. And then as soon as they got to the promised land, Joshua came face to face with this angel. Now, if Michael is Christ, that means that Joshua 
came face to face with Yehoshua, Christ, because that's Christ's name, Yehoshua. It's not Jesus. His name is Yehoshua, which means Yehoah is salvation. So Joshua, right, the son of Nun, who preceded, who came after Moses when Moses died, who led the nation of Israel, Joshua was, Joshua was leading them, right? He came face to face with an angel. And, and, and um, by the way, Joshua, the successor of Moses, his name was not Joshua. His name is not Joshua. His name is actually Hosea. If you read the Bible, you will see there's one sentence. It says his name is not Joshua. His name was Hosea. But Moses kept calling him Joshua. Why did the Spirit of God keep impelling Moses to call this man, son of Nun, as Joshua? Because he is leading the Israelites into the promised land. Just like Christ, Yehoshua, is going to lead us into the promised land. Now, Yehoshua in English is Jehoshua. We say Yehovah as God's name, but in English it's Jehovah, right? Because the Y becomes a J. After the 1600s, after, created by the German monk, the, the letter Y became a J. So we don't say Johan, we say John, right? Y became a J. So Yehoshua is really Jehoshua or Joshua. So Christ's name in English is actually Joshua. So, so he, even though the man's name was Hosea, Moses kept calling him Joshua because he was going to lead them into the promised land. Okay, so Joshua is, is now face to face with a certain angel. And what is that angel's name? Michael. But what is Michael's other name? Joshua. Because Michael is Christ. If Michael is Christ, then Joshua is meeting face to face with Joshua. So now Joshua meets this angel and he says, are you with us or against us? And then the angel said, neither, but I am the commander of God's angels in heaven. Hmm. So obviously this is Michael because we know Michael is the commander of God's angels based on Daniel and based on the book of Revelation. You understand Daniel, you'll understand Revelation. Okay. So he said, I'm the commander of God's angels in heaven. This is the angel that was guiding the Israelites by pillar of fire by night and pillar of clouds by day. That same angel materialized himself as a man when they came to the promised land because now it's like his job is done, right? So he's meeting Joshua face to face. So Joshua is meeting Yahushua, a.k.a. Joshua, a.k.a. Mikael, because the commander of, angel, of God's angels in heaven is meaning face to face. So Michael means the one who is like God. Now, why would Mike? Why would God? Why would God name this angel as Michael? Remember, God gives names based on the character of a person. So even though Hosea was Joshua's name before Moses named him as Joshua, even though Hosea was his name, God, the Spirit of God, impelled Moses to call him Joshua because of the character he was going to uh, um, represent. Mike. Yeah, the video ended. I don't know which part it ended on, but um, the video ended. But um, Michael. His real name is Michael. But when he came to the earth, Christ said, the, God said, he will be called Emmanuel. But Emmanuel is not really his name. Emmanuel just means with us is God. God is with us. Okay. He would also be called Prince of Peace, but that's not his name. He will be called Jehoshua, Joshua, which you say Jesus, but that's not his name. Okay. Watch watch my video where, I, where it's titled, um, Know the Truth. Know God's true name based on the names of his people, right? And in that video, I explained to you why you should not be saying Jesus. In my other videos too, I, 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 I explained that a little bit. But in that video, I really hit home with the point. So you'll probably like that video a little bit more. But um, God gives names based on the character of, of an individual, right? So Michael means the one who is like God. They say it is a question form or it could be a statement form. I see a deception in that. It is a statement form. The one who is like God. Now, even though, why would God name him that? Because he is the only one who is actually like God. Why? You see why, as I started off in the beginning of this audio or this video, that the Bible translators removed the term son of God, sons of God and re replaced it with sons of Israel. Hmm. Man. So devious, but I see right through that. And you will too, when you read it and meditate on it. Gabriel is the son of God. Satan, the devil, is the son of God, right? But they would, but Satan will die as, as men do. He's the son of God. He's the God of this wicked system of things. God has many sons in heaven. But Christ or we could say Michael, but let's say Christ for the sake of those of you who might not believe that Michael is Christ. But hmm, when you come to realize that Christ Christ is Michael, I wonder how you're going to feel about that. And remember, it doesn't diminish anyone's position to be called an angel. Okay, God can be his own angel if he sends himself on his own mission. Because angel just means messenger of God himself. Okay, so 
God has many sons. Now, now, Michael is a son of God, right? But Christ is also called a son of God. But Christ has a unique phrase. He's called the only begotten son of God. The only begotten son of God. Why? If the Bible says that all things were made through Christ, then that means someone was making it but through Christ. If the Bible says Christ is the firstborn son of God and God has other sons in heaven, that means just just bear with me. But I know your your interpretation of the phrase only begotten son and the phrase firstborn Son of God is, is different from how I interpret it. But please just hear me out. And I'm not oblivious to what you think it means. I agree with that term too. But you have to understand that many things in the Bible have two meanings. It's not just one. Just like prophecy. It's always twofold. Christ is the firstborn son of God. Think of it literally. Okay. Just think of it literally. Maybe you can't think that far. <laughs> think of it literally. God makes Christ first. If God makes Christ first, then he's the son of God, right? But if the scripture says that God made all, if the scripture says that all things were made through Christ, then it means that after God made Christ, God made nothing else except through Christ. So no matter how many sons God has, none of them will be a begotten son of God except for Christ because Christ came from the very essence of God himself and everything else came through the son of God. So Adam is the son of God. But he's not, a, he's not a begotten son of God because he came through the combination of the two. He came through the combination of both God and his son. God said, let us make man in our image. But God never said, let us make a, a first creation. God is alone and he makes his first creation, Christ. And then through Christ, he teaches him how to do everything. So Christ is his firstborn, literally. So Christ is the ark messenger of God. If, if God is going to send anyone on an ultimate mission... Mission, it will be his very firstborn son. And since God himself cannot die, and Christ can die because he's a created being, if God is going to send someone to die, it will be his son because he himself cannot die. So the scripture says, God loved the world so much that he sent, not himself, because God himself cannot die. That would be blasphemy. Just like God himself cannot lie, God cannot die. But God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for us. He didn't send himself. He sent his only begotten son. Why is Christ his only begotten son? Because he's the only one that God himself directly begot. And everybody else, the devils, Gabriel, came through the son of God. All things were made through the son, through the son, and for the son, whether visible or invisible. So when Christ comes to the earth, his mission is not to glorify himself because he knows there's one greater than himself. And when he goes to heaven, that one is his God and father. And he says, you marvel at the wonderful things I'm doing right now. But when I go to heaven, my father will show me greater works than these. So that will show me how to do greater works than these. So that you will marvel and say, wow, Christ is powerful, but his father is a beast. Okay. And then when Christ goes to heaven, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he will rule as king over the years for a thousand years, only for a thousand years. And then he would hand back the king, the throne and kingship back to his God and father. So Christ is not God. Christ is Mikael, the one who is like God. If, if, if God makes Christ and no one else is made through the essence of God, I mean by the essence of God, except Christ, then Christ is special like no other created, created being in the universe. That's why Paul says he is the exact image of the Father. He is in the exact likeness of, of, of God. Okay? And, all, and God will command all the angels to do obeisance to his Son. They will worship his son, but to the glory of, of, of Christ's God and Father. So even though they will be worshiping Christ, it will not be to the ignorance of the fact that God is there. It will be to the glory of the one who made him king and, and priest, right? So, so, for example, have not the angels always worshipped God? The angels have always worshipped God, but they've never worshipped the son. So why is it that God is commanding the angels to worship his son? Don't you see that? Because this is something new. Because of what Christ has done. Remember, Christ was killed by the devil, by the influence of the devil. So, But the devil wanted to be worshipped. This is what the devil wants. So God 
is giving his son, his only begotten son, the exact thing that the devil wanted. It's like a slap in the face of the devil. And the devil tried to went ahead of God, went, go ahead of God, and try and make God's son worship him. The devil tried to get the son of God to worship him and say, if you, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. And then what did the son of God say? He said, it is written, God alone you must worship. And to him alone you must render sacred service. So Christ worshipped his father. He worships his father. And if Christ is God, what type of temptation is that? That the devil is going to give God the kingdoms of the world, something that already belongs, everything belongs to God. You can't tempt God with anything, nor does God tempt anyone. God cannot be tempted. And the devil knows that. So, the, But the devil knows that Christ is not God. He knows who Christ is. And that's why the devil has tried to deceive you and blind you on who Christ really is and show you the great relationship between the father and the son. Christ says, I, my father, are one. He doesn't mean they are the same equal. He already said he's not equal to the father. So in what sense does he mean that he is one with the father? The man and the woman will become one. But the man is head of the wife. But they are one. Doesn't mean equality. It just means you work together. The wife will not do anything of her own initiative. She'll consult her husband. Christ does nothing of his own initiative. Only what he beholds the father doing. Only what his father commands him to do. But they work together. Christ said, Father, I pray that the congregation become one, just as you and I are one. Is Peter going to become Paul? Is Luke going to become Bar Bartholomew? Is Matthew going to become John? No, but they're going to be one in what sense? They're going to work together. There's going to be unity. There's going to be peace. There's not going to be rivalry like the world, like worldly people. There's going to be organization. There's going to be, there's going to be an organized you know, accomplishment of God's will. That's what sense Christ means when he says one. But when he goes back to heaven, again, when Christ goes back to heaven, before Christ was in, before Christ came down, when every prophet saw, saw God on the throne, it's only one entity on the throne. All of a sudden, when Christ dies and goes to heaven, now there's two entities. There's not three, so no trinity. There's two entities now. Why? Because God has made his son king at his right-hand side, but only for a thousand years. God is always there, but now when, when, when Stephen sees a vision, Christ is at the right-hand side of God. When Paul sees a vision... He was Saul, and then before he became Paul, he saw a vision, and then became Paul, he saw Christ at the right-hand side of God. So now there are two entities on the throne, not just one. You see? There are two entities on the throne, not just one. So Christ is at the right-hand side of God, but for how long? For a thousand years. And then Christ would hand back the, 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 God, the kingship to his God and Father, so that God will be, God, will be, will be everything to everyone. Christ is Michael, the archangel, and he is the only begotten son of God in that sense of the word that he is the only son of God, even though God has many sons in heaven. Christ is the only one that God directly made from himself and everything else came through, through Christ. Did God do this again before? I mean, did God do, ever do this again? Yeah. When God made Adam, he made Adam by means of his son, right? He made Adam and then through Adam, all other sons of God came into existence. God didn't make every single son like by himself. He made Adam and then through Adam, he gave Adam the ability to, cre to create by means of a woman. He, he made his son, the greater Adam, Christ. The Bible says Christ is the greater Adam. God made Christ and then through Christ, he gave Christ the ability to create. But he didn't give Christ the ability to create by giving him a woman to give birth to, you know, to, that will give birth to children. No, he gave Christ the ability to create things. So Christ is a God. Okay. And Adam is, is head of the earth. He's like the God of the earth, like head of the earth. And he, he has in subjection, everything on the earth, but Christ has in subjection, everything in the heavens. But because Adam lost his position as our father, now, because, because through Adam, all are dying. Now through Christ, all will be made alive. So now, Christ has become our father, literally. Not father in the sense that God is our father. No, because even Christ said, we have only one father. So in what sense is Christ our father? In the sense that Adam is our father, because Adam is our father. Abraham is also our father. My literal father is also my father, Benjamin, who, who my mother, Grace, my father, Benjamin, is my father. Adam is also my father. Abraham is also my father. Christ is my father in the sense that Adam was my father. And he will be my father eternally. Because if Adam never sinned, Adam will always be my father eternally. So that's why Paul said, so now Christ has become first in all things. He's not just the first creation in heaven by God. Now he is the first creation on earth 
in the sense that Adam was the first creation of man on earth because Adam has lost his position as our father. So, so that, so that now Christ is first in all things and he is the firstborn from the dead as well, twofold. He's the firstborn from the dead as well because he's the first one that actually died and has been resurrected and will never die again. He's the firstborn from the dead, from the dead, but he is literally the only begotten son of God. In what sense is he the only begotten son of God if he's not literally the only begotten son of God? And he's the firstborn son of God. He is the angel that killed all the firstborns of, of Egypt. The Passover, the Passover was nice and 14. That was nice and 14 in the time of Egypt when they were freed from Egypt. That angel that came to kill all the firstborns of, 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 of um, Egypt was Michael. The same angel that guided them by pillar of fire by night and, and cloud by day and, and watched over them. And God said, Jehovah, not Christ. God said of Christ as an angel, he said, he told Moses, be careful. Watch yourself regarding this angel because my name is in him. And he will not forgive your, your errors and, or your transgressions. So this angel, Michael, is the word of God, the archangel, because God does not speak on his own behalf. He sends people to speak for him. Because when he did it at one time, they said, no, let not God speak with us for fear that we may die. So God has always been sending people in his name. But out of all the people that God has sent in his name, Michael is the ark of them. If Christ is the word of God, then he has to be Christ. Because I mean, then he has to be Michael. Because if Michael is the archangel, which according to the Bible, he is, then how can you have Michael as the archangel, as the word of God, and then Christ as the word of God, but yet they're, yet they're not the same? And then when Michael stands up in the book of Daniel, the great tribulation begins. Distress as, such as has never occurred in the world since, since the world's beginning. When Michael stands, and the, the phrase to stand up means to become king. Just like the phrase sit at my right hand side also means to become king. In Hebrew, in Hebraic term, that's what it means. So Michael, the great prince, will stand up. The Michael, Michael, the great prince who's standing on behalf of your people. He's the one who protects Israel. Again, Michael protected Israel. He's, he led them through to the promised land. Michael stands up in the last days. That means to become king. And when he becomes king, the great tribulation begins. When Christ becomes king in Revelation, the great tribulation begins. Michael is a commander of angels. Christ is a commander of angels. God said that, that Christ is the one who is going to take care of the devil. But in Revelation, Michael is the one who takes care of the devil. He's the one with the, with, with the keys. And then Christ says, when you hear my, the day is coming when many will hear my voice and will be resurrected. But yet, his voice, according to the book of Thessalonians, is the voice of the archangel. So, Christ is the archangel. Which is why Christ keeps telling you that I did not come in my own name. I came in my Father's name. The Father is greater than I am. The Father will show me greater works than these so that you will be amazed. He says, he says, Father, let not my will be done, but let your will be done. So, he is a separate entity. He is Michael the archangel. He has his own will. He would prefer not to die, but he submits to the will of his father. Even though he is in the exact image of his father, and he is in a sense like God himself, because no one else is like God except for the very first being that God created. But even though he is in the exact essence of his, his God and father, Christ calls him his Christ even calls God as his God and Father. That's not even just me saying it. The Bible says that Christ calls God as his God and Father, even when he's in heaven, according to the book of Revelation. Christ has a God and Father. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation which the revelation of Christ, which God gave him, that he gave, that Christ gave to his angel, because Christ is a commander of angel. Michael is a commander of angel. So that angel belongs to him because God created all angels through Christ. So that angel belongs to him. He's a commander of angels. The revelation from God, Elohim, the Almighty, which the, the revelation of Christ, which God, the Almighty, gave him which he gave, which Christ gave to his angel, and that angel gave to John. There are four characters introduced in, the John, in John chapter 1. Where is the Holy Spirit in all of this? The Holy Spirit is God's active force. The Holy Spirit can speak, sure, but it is not a literal person. It is God. God can speak through anything. God can make the rock speak, but is a rock a person? So if God can make a rock cry out and preach for him, can he make his Holy Spirit speak? But the Holy Spirit is not a God apart from God. There are, no, there, are not, there are not three entities on the throne. It is one entity, and Christ is not part of that entity. That's why when Christ became king at the right, God's right-hand side, he is not the same as God, but he's at God's right-hand side as the lamb who was slain. 
And Christ says, you are my friends and you will rule with me. And, we'll, and, and he calls his, his, disciples, his disciples as his brothers. But God has no brothers. God only has sons. That's blasphemy to say that God has brothers. So there's a lot for y'all to think about. It's a lot for y'all to think about. And I hope, you know, y'all just going to start thinking. Just because your parents have taught you something and it's been indoctrinated in your head does not mean it's true. Christmas is false. Trinity is false. Easter is false. Hellfire is false. All these things came from the Catholic Church. And y'all know how demonic the Catholic, the Catholic Church is and has been used to a great extent by the devil. Okay? And all those who disagreed with the Catholic Church that Christ was not part of the Trinity were killed. You think God did that or you think the devil did that? Okay, the Bible was kept in Latin. You think God did that or the devil did that? God's name was removed. God's name, Yehoah, Y-H-W-H, Yehoah, was removed. You think God did that or the devil did that? In the New, in the Christian Greek, in, in the Greek Testament, in New Testament, Greek, Greek manuscripts, God's name, Yehoah, is not even mentioned once. You think God did that or the devil did that? And then they changed Christ's name from Yeshua to Jesus, which sounds like Zeus. You think God did that or the devil did that? And then when, when this new organization came about in the, in the last days, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, which many, uh, many of y'all don't like, but when they came about, they were persecuted. The only religion who bears God's name within them, and they have been made as a laughingstock in the world. People make fun of them. Who's knocking on the door? Oh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, don't pay attention to them. You think that's, a, that's, that's, that's God denouncing their work or the devil? You think when they teach that hellfire is false, you think that's, that's, that's the devil that wants you to think that God is wicked enough to torment people in hell? Or you, think, or, you, or, 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 you think, or you think that's something demonic? A lot for y'all to think about, but I'm going to end here. I mean, I'm, that's, what's like, that's like, what, 40 minutes already? Yeah, I could talk all day, man. I, so I, as y'all know, I love talking about God, but later. Peace. So now imagine that all this time is passing where <laughs> all this time is passing where people are worshiping the son and give no recognition to the father. Christ said, "Father, I came to make your name known." What is his father what is his father's name known? Do you even know it? Do you even know his father's name? Or do you just know Jesus? The one whom you call Jesus is actually called Yeshua or Joshua in English, but you call him Jesus. Now this Jesus, he said, "I have made your name known to them, Father." I have made your name known to them. I have taught them your name. But yet, what name do you know? In Psalms 110 verse 1, it says, your Bible is going to translate it this way because they removed Christ's Father's name and put Lord. Right? And then in the New Testament, they never mention Christ's Father's name, but they mention Christ's name but the Greek form of Christ's name, which is Jesus, which sounds like a pagan deity, Zeus. But in Psalms 110 verse 1, Yehovah, Elohim, the original um, um, Hebrew, te the tetragrammaton is there, Y-H-W-H. It says, Yehovah said to my Lord. Who is the Lord? Christ. Who is Yehovah? Yehovah, Almighty. So Christ's father is telling Christ. So the father is telling his son, son, sit at my right hand until I place all your, until I place all your enemies at the sole of your feet. The father is telling his son, son, sit at my right hand because of what you've done on the earth. I'm going to reward you with kingship. I'm going to reward you with honor, with worship. He, the father is not going to worship the son. No, but the son worshiped the father. <laughs> okay. Get that straight. And the angels are going to be worshipping the sun but for a thousand years, not forever. Because the sun, even though he is like God, he is not God. But the sun will be worshipped. But in Psalms 110 verse 1, it says, But your Bible translation won't say Yehovah. It will say, And the Lord said to my Lord. <laughs> the Lord said to my Lord. Which Lord is which? That's why the devil made sure that God's name was removed from the Bible. So that whenever you see Lord, you just think of the Son. You will never think of the Father. And when the son came down to the earth and glorified his father's name and made his father's name known, still you don't know the father's name. <laughs> Only you know Jesus. And Jesus isn't even, even, isn't even his name. His name is Yehoshua. Now remember, God said about the angel, my name is in him, right? My name is in him. Name means, in Hebrew, means character. 
So God is saying my character is in him. The very essence of who I am is within him. So be careful because even though he is not me, he has the authority to either pardon your sins or not forgive your sins. And this one will not forgive your sins because this one is like me. He is like God. He is like his father. He, this one isn't Gabriel, <laughs> okay? This one isn't the angel that when you try to worship, he says, no, 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 don't do that. Be careful because I'm not God. This No, this angel is like, no, go ahead, worship me because he is like me, okay? And when he comes to the earth and dies in your behalf, this same angel that's guiding you through the wilderness, he will one day come to the earth and die for you and, and he will pardon your sins and he will teach you about me because I myself cannot literally come down here because I am God. And he will come down and die for you because, because he can die. And he trusts that I will resurrect him. But I myself cannot die. And then you will say, well, then didn't Christ say tear down this temple and I will raise it up in three days? So, so you will say Christ resurrected himself, right? Well, and you, and you say, well, but the Bible says that God resurrected Christ. But yet Christ said tear this temple down and I will raise it up in three days. So Christ must be God. Okay, first of all, look at your ignorance. Whenever Christ healed somebody, what did he say? He made it clear to them that they healed themselves by means of their faith. Is that a lie? He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. He heals a leper. He says, go away in peace because your faith has healed you. So in the sense if a person dies and they have faith that they'll be resurrected by God, they resurrected themselves. They healed themselves from death by means of their faith. Christ is telling you that he is not equal to the Father. He is not the Father. He's telling you that the Father is greater than he is. But he's telling you that I have been put, I will be put to death unjustly. I'm a perfect man. I've never sinned. I will be put to death unjustly. But I have so much faith in my, in, in my, in my Father that I know he will resurrect me. And because of my faith, I will, in, in a sense, it is like I am raising myself from death. He says, no one, no one is going to kill me. I give myself he says, I lay down my own life because Christ, Christ is a perfect man. He's strong. He lays down his own life. No one takes it from him, but he lays it down on his own accord. And for this reason, he has every right to claim back his life from his God and father. And because he has that faith in his father to resurrect him, it is as if he, resurrect, he resurrected himself. Christ speaks in, in this term, in this terminology, which makes you think he is God, but he tells you, be careful. Do not say I'm God because I'm telling you that my father is greater than I am. And I'm telling you that when I go to heaven, in my father's house, not in my house, in my father's house, there are many house, there are many abodes, many rooms. And I'm going there to prepare a room for you, for a place for you to come and stay with me because you are my friends. In his father's house, not in his own house. Now, the other thing, um, when, when, whenever, whenever, um, God says, man, I... Should I even talk about this? Because it's going to take a while. No, I've made videos on that point. So um, if, if you don't find that video, maybe, you know, but if God wants you to see that video, he'll direct your attention to that video. I have every confidence in that. But um, let me talk about this point, about that angel who is Christ, actually, who, who came to die in behalf of Israel. The same angel that was guiding Israel came to manifest himself in flesh and died for Israel because he is the word of God, not the literal word of God. God has his own mouth. But he's a word of God in the sense that he speaks for God. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning of what? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. So in the beginning of creation, in the beginning was the word. The word was the very first creation of God. But God didn't create his own word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Christ is with his father. And the word was with God. But John 1.1, 1, 1, it's like, and like, I've made videos on that also. But again, I want to talk about that angel. But John 1.1, 1, 1, Oh my goodness. So the angel, the angel, he says, be careful with this angel because my name is in him, right? Now, when Christ came, he came in his father's name, Yehoshua. When you say Yehoshua, I shouldn't even really be talking about this one too, because this one is in that video that I, that I told you I have to watch. So actually I'm going to end it here and I'm going to post a link in the description below. Christ says, many will say to me in that day, many will say to me, in that day, Lord, 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 they will not prophesy in your name and expel demons in your name and perform any powerful works in your name. We did these things. Yet Christ will confess to them, get away from me. I never knew you. Hmm? Because you keep glorifying me 
and not my father. And if Christ was any regular person, he would accept the adoration. If Christ was the devil, <laughs> he would accept that. He wants that. Yeah, worship me. Forget about my father. Worship me. Worship me. Yes, 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 me. But even though God says that his son will be worshipped, now it has, is not the time. And when we, when, when we are to worship his son, when we are to worship Christ, it will be to the glory of his God and Father. The Bible says, we, the Bible says, and God will command the angels to do obeisance to his son, to the glory of Christ's God and Father. So we will worship Christ to the glory of his God and Father, not, 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 not to the disrespect of his God and Father, by showing his Father no respect, by only worshiping the son and not even acknowledging that the Father is there. And you, and even you Trinitarians, you say the son is Christ. Well, then what is the father's name? Why do you disrespect the father by not even giving him respect, by acknowledging him? But Christ loves his father so much. And the father loves the son so much. But the son loves the father so much. <laughs> Isaac loved Abraham so much that he was willing to die for Abraham. Christ loved, God loved the world so much that he sent his son. Yes, but... <laughs> Christ loved the world so much that he was willing to die for the world because of his father, even though he didn't want to go through that, even though he prayed and, and begged his father that, you know, let this cup pass from me. I do not want to die, but yet let out my will be done. Let your will be done. Christ loved the father so much that even though you are worshiping him, he doesn't even, he doesn't accept that worship and he will confess to you that he never knew you, even though you called his name, Lord, 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 and perform many powerful works in his name. He will, he will tell you that he never knew you. Get, get it straight <laughs> Worship the father Don't worship the son The time has not yet come For us to worship the son Of course for the mainstream Of those that consider themselves Christians They believe that Jesus is God and in fact, some of the evangelicals say Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christian Because they reject the deity Of Christ in other words, uh, we don't believe in the Trinity, and for that reason, we're not Christian. But, but people have been arguing and disputing who Jesus is since, well, since Jesus is on the earth. <laughs> on one occasion, Jesus asked his apostles, who are people saying the Son of Man is? And they responded, well, yes, some are saying that uh, you're John the Baptist, and Others are saying that you're Elijah, and others are saying you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus asked them, who though do you say I am? And Peter, Simon Peter, the outspoken one said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it's interesting that Jesus responded to him and said, Blessed you are, Simon, because flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. But my Father, who is in the heavens, did. Now, the most people living then, the Jews, had heard of Jesus, and many of them saw him, and, and uh, they heard him speak, and they saw him perform many miracles, and yet they refused to accept him as the Son of God, as the Christ. And Jesus explained that the reason they couldn't do that, the reason they couldn't listen to him, is because they didn't accept his father. Things really haven't changed today, have they? The devil's still ruling the world, and he still has the power to twist the truth and blind our minds to the truth. But Jehovah has the power to open our minds to the truth. And if we want to know the truth, then Jehovah will open up our minds to grasp the truth. In the eighth chapter of Romans, uh, Paul referred to Jesus as being the firstborn of many brothers. He was the first anointed to be to, to destined to become immortal, to have life in himself. And there were other anointed persons, 144,000 ultimately, uh, who will be like Christ in that sense, what it means to be the firstborn. Because throughout the scriptures, it's, it refers to Jesus as being the firstborn or the only begotten. Or as it says in uh, Revelation 3.14, that he is the beginning of the creation by God.
So Revelation 3.14, just just uh, bear with me for a second. Uh, Revelation 3.14, now when you go to your Bible, right, it may say he is the he is the he is the new creation he's the new creation of God or something like that. But when you look at the original Greek manuscript, here like the um the lexicon, look on the left left to the left of the screen, and in the middle you see the Greek, and then you see the Strong's um interpretation, and then you see the original, right on the on the extreme to the right. So when you read it here on the left, translated it translated literally from Greek, it says to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right, the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God. So whatever your translation says, they just put something extra there to make you think that Christ is not the first creation of God. But simply put, he is the beginning of the creation of God. And continue to the video. Because throughout the scriptures, it's, it refers to Jesus as being the firstborn or the only begotten. Or as it says in uh, Revelation 3.14, that he is the beginning of the creation by God. But Trinitarians don't believe that Jesus was actually born or begotten. And they say that the reason he's called firstborn is because he is the most prominent and they cite a couple of examples in the Old Testament where, uh, see, for, for one thing, it was a very honored position to be the firstborn male because you got a double inheritance. And um, so, but there were a couple of exceptions where an individual who was not literally the firstborn received the accolades and the honors and privileges of being the firstborn. So they claim, well, this has to apply to Jesus because he wasn't really born. And God isn't really his father, as we understand, and he's not really a son. So, <laughs> But that's really a, a, a very awkward way of saying that God is the most prominent. He's the firstborn. That only has meaning being born in relation to your peers, your brothers. And God has no peer or brothers. The almighty God suffices to say that he has no equal. At any rate, the scripture I read does not say that God is the firstborn. I'll read that again. It says, but when he again brings his firstborn into the inhabited earth. So God has a firstborn. He's not firstborn. He possesses a firstborn son. Uh, when Jehovah brings him into the world for the second time, the second coming of Christ. And it's on that occasion that God commands the angels to bow before his firstborn. Now, if this firstborn were God, <laughs> why would this be some kind of big deal? Haven't the angels always worshipped God? Uh, sure, they've always worshipped God. But Paul was pointing out something different he's saying that god is commanding the angels to worship someone other than himself if you go to the book of revelation the fifth chapter it's before jesus is given this see the scroll with seven seals to the lamb they say you are worthy to open the scroll and they confer upon him. They said, you're worthy, the one on the throne, God, and you are worthy of all the honor and all the blessing and all the glory. The reason being because Jesus, the lamb, was slaughtered. See, Jehovah has always possessed the glory and the honor, hasn't he? But if you go back to the second chapter of Philippians, where Jesus emptied himself, came to be in fashion as a man, and then it says he humbled himself and became obedient as far as death. I read on, for this very reason, God exalted him to a superior position and gave him a name above every other name, so that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bend. Those in heaven, those under the earth, who haven't been resurrected yet, and Every living creature will bend their knee to Jesus 
not because he's God, but because God honored him and conferred upon him the blessing and the honor because he gave his life. So back in that fifth chapter of Revelation, it mentions that these 24 elders bow and worship the one on the throne and the lamb who is in the midst of the throne. So Jehovah confers this honor upon his son and Jehovah commands all creation to worship his son. But (laughs) at the end of Christ's 1,000 year reign, what does it say in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 24 through 28? It says that after after he uh, subjects everything, it says the son himself will subject himself to God, that God may be all things to everyone. So Jehovah gives all this honor and power and privilege to Jesus. Jesus rules in the name of Jehovah, but after a certain time, when all things have been subjected to Christ, as if he were God, then Jesus hands back the power to Jehovah. And so it really tells us quite a bit about Jehovah's character, doesn't it? You know, back in the Garden of Eden, the devil said some terrible things about God. In fact, the word devil means slanderer. He slandered God. And he implied that God, you know, doesn't trust his creation. They can't be trusted. And and that God is a little bit paranoid, maybe. He doesn't want to share too much. He gives us, he doesn't want to give you all the knowledge because he doesn't know how you will handle that. (laughs) So here Jehovah gives Jesus everything. I'm going to let the phone ring. He slandered God. And he implied that God, you know, doesn't trust his creation. They can't be trusted. And and that God is a little bit paranoid, maybe. He doesn't want to share too much. He gives us, he doesn't want to give you all the knowledge because he doesn't know how you will handle that. (laughs) So here Jehovah gives Jesus everything. I'm going to let the phone ring. So here Jehovah gives Jesus everything. So here Jehovah gives Jesus everything. He slandered God. And he implied that God, you know, doesn't trust his creation. They can't be trusted. And and that God is a little bit paranoid, maybe. He doesn't want to share too much. He gives us, he doesn't want to give you all the knowledge because he doesn't know how you will handle that. (laughs) So here Jehovah gives Jesus, everything. I'm going to let the phone ring. Christ was killed by the devil, by the influence of the devil. So, But the devil wanted to be worshipped. This is what the devil wants. So God is giving his son, his only begotten son, the exact thing that the devil wanted. It's like a slap in the face of the devil. He slandered God. And he implied that God you know, doesn't trust his creation. They can't be trusted. And and that God is a little bit paranoid, maybe. He doesn't want to share too much. He gives us, he doesn't want to give you all the knowledge because he doesn't know how you will handle that. (laughs) So here Jehovah gives Jesus everything. I'm going to let the phone ring. I'm going to read these to you. Please excuse the noise in the background. I'm going to read these few scriptures to you, and, I'll, and um, that will be the end of the video. Um, and I'll quote the scriptures of each verse so that you can use your own Bible to see what it says. And, of course, always consult the original manuscripts. Always consult the original Greek and Hebrew texts to see the true, correct translation or make your own um evaluation of what the scripture is actually saying don't re- don't rely on another man's interpretation of god's word okay for the father loves the son very much and shows him all that he does yes and the father will show the son even greater works than these 
so that you will be amazed. John 5, verse 20. <laughs> oh, man. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. John 3, 35. Do you not see the beautiful relationship between the Father and the Son? This is completely lost if you believe that the Father is the Son and they are the same. Then it's nothing special. <laughs> God is giving Himself everything. You know, God is giving everything in His own hands. Okay. Um, God loves Himself so much. Um, and God will show Himself greater works than these so that you'll be amazed. What sense does that make? All right, let me continue. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. John 17, verse 26. Do you see how Christ speaks that I in them and you in me? You would think it's like some, you know, they're the same person or something like that. But here, here it is. But because he's speaking of humans too, now you know he doesn't really literally mean he in them. Because otherwise, it will mean that he will be inside of Paul and Peter and Luke and Matthew and Bartholomew, right? No, he is saying that he will be in them in that they are together as one in unity. Understand the language in which Christ speaks. Okay, let me say, let me read the scripture again. And I'm going to stop explaining so that you guys could move on with your life. <laughs> I made known to them your, I have made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with, with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. John 17, 26. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world, whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. John 17, verse 6. I got to explain this one too. The word is does not belong to Christ. These words come from his father. But because God is not speaking for himself, but he's sending someone to speak in his name, whoever is speaking in his name is like his word. But Christ is the word of God. Moses was also a word of God. He came to speak in God's name. But, okay, let me keep it moving. In that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. John 14, 20. Understand this language, please. In prayer to his father, Christ prayed. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, father, and I am in you. And may they be in us. So that the world will believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me. So that they may be one just as you and I are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity. That the world will know that you sent me. And that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory that you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them. And I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. This is John. This is taken from John chapter 17. Oh man, how, how do people not see this? The precious relationship between the father and son is lost when you think that the father is the son and the son is the father. No, they are separate. But this is the close relationship between the father and the son. Uh, John chapter 17 verse 8 says, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and they have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Now, who is this you that Christ keeps talking about? His name is Jehovah, but you don't even know his name. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, let's continue. For I have not spoken of my own authority, 
But the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. John 12, verse 49 and 50. Let me explain this a little bit. So because what God has told his son to speak to us contains eternal life within it, those who listen to the word of Christ will have eternal life. Because that word does not come from Christ, but comes from his father. So if you so so through Christ we gain everlasting life. He is the way and the life and the truth. But that doesn't mean he is God. He is the ultimate messenger of God, but he is not God. He's telling you he's not God. He's telling you that there is someone who sent him, and that one is greater than he is. <sighs> Let's keep it moving. I have revealed you. To those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have obeyed your they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words that you gave me, and they accepted them. Right? He is speaking the words of his father. So he is like the word of God. He is the ultimate, he's the ark word of God. He's the ark messenger of God. He's the archangel of God. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, Father. Holy Father, protect them. By the power of your name, the name you gave me. Remember the angel that God said, my name is in him. Watch yourself because he will not forgive your transgressions. Because this is a special angel because my name is in him. Remember? Okay. Christ is saying, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. The name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. John 17, verse 3 through 11. Understand these things, people, please. Give the Father his respect. The respect that the Son wants you to show the Father. Exodus 23, verse 20 and 21. This is the last one I'm going to read. See, I am sending an angel. Oh, yeah, this is about the angel. Um, yeah. Exodus 23, verse 20 and 21. See, I am sending an angel before you to protect you on your journey. And lead you safely to the place I have prepared for you. Pay close attention to him and obey his voice. Obey his word. Do not rebel against him, for he will not forgive your sins, because my name is in him. This is the same angel that came to die for us. Angel literally means word of God. Anglos, word. El, Elohim, word of God. So the archangel would be the arc word of God, or in short, the word of God. Now, this word of God became flesh. The same angel that was protecting the Israelites came to become flesh before the Israelites and die for, it, for the Israelites. And then because he did that, God raised him to a superior position and raised him as king at his right-hand side. Michael will stand up. He became king. The very thing that the devil wanted, God has given his firstborn son. And he will rule. Not forever, but he will rule for a thousand years. And 1 Corinthians 15, he will hand back the throne and Godship to his God and Father. And when you read the book of Proverbs, I believe it's Proverbs chapter 8. I hope it's Proverbs chapter 8 so that you guys can read it. Where wisdom is being personified. And people say that this is just wisdom being personified. It is not. It does not reference Christ. But Christ is called the wisdom of God. But Solomon is 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 writing about how Christ was how wisdom was of was the very first creation of God, right? And of course, God is eternal. God always had wisdom. He never needed to create wisdom. Whatever whatever God is is always eternally with Him. God doesn't need to create something. For him to have it. He already has it. So if God is saying he's creating wisdom at the beginning of his way, then he is being, he's, this is sim, sim, symbolism, this is symbolic. It's, and since Christ is called the wisdom of God, literally he's saying God created 
Christ as the as the beginning of his way. Christ is the firstborn of all creation. Christ is the is the beginning of God's creation. Wisdom. Christ is is the wisdom of God. So if God created wisdom at the beginning of his way, then he created Christ at the beginning of his way. And when you read it, that chapter, you see how the bond between wisdom and God, the relationship between wisdom and God, and how wisdom was the master worker of God, how Christ was the master worker of God, and how wisdom was there when God was creating the universe, and how he came to be beside his father as a master worker, and he was constantly happy besides beside his father day by day he was glad to be beside his father because his father was using him to create everything and everything was made through wisdom everything was made through christ christ is the wisdom of god as paul said and then in the end of the chapter it says that and wisdom was fond of the sons of men of the sons of israel michael was fond of the sons of israel michael wisdom christ was leading israel and then eventually michael wisdom christ came and died and give his life for the sons of Israel because he took interest in the sons of Israel. Like the, the ending of Proverbs chapter 8, I believe it's chapter, chapter 8, says. But wisdom is not God. God has wisdom. God does not need to create wisdom. God does not need to create his power. He already has his power. He already has his wisdom. So just like Christ is not the literal word of God, he's not the literal wisdom of God. But this is all expression. We know how symbolic the Bible is. People, wake up.